Good. So good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So I, I, I'm, I have a double hat. I'm part of the organizers, but also an invited lecture. So anyway, I would like to start first to thank uh, ICTS and CFNS for the support and, and make it me happen to be here. This is my second time in India, so I'm very happy to be, be here. The first time was just before the lockdown. <laughs> so it's a new experience. So as you see on the, uh, on the program here, um, uh, we start with uh, uh, lectures. I was asked uh, to uh, coordinate with Professor Despande to give lectures a sort of pedagogical introduction to QCD and the physics of the EIC. So we decided to split uh, these lectures, uh, which are labeled PEIC here, in two parts. I will give the first part today. Uh, so uh, I will deal with the pedagogical QCD, <laughs> quote, quote. And I will in try to introduce the pro open problems uh, uh, in order to, uh, to uh, introduce the, the lectures by Professor Despande tomorrow, he will uh, speak about the physics of EAC. Uh, so um, uh, what I mean by pedagogical, uh, of course, I have just two hours, so I will, uh, will give you uh, basically a really uh, um, uh, a, um, a flavor of the, the main features of the QCD. And I, I won't be rigorous, of course, and I will be sloppy in the notations. So I try to be as intuitive as possible. And, uh, and then I will list the open problems, as I said, in order to let uh, Professor Despande introduce the, the AIC as a potential machine that will try to answer to a machine that will potentially try to answer to these problems. Uh, in my lectures, um, I, I will. Uh, skip details of calculations, but uh, um, I, I would like to leave them to you in cases where they are simple. And as therefore, I will su suggest, propose three different homeworks that you can, you can try to, uh, to, the, uh, to do yourself. And we could uh, discuss them here at the end of the day in the last session, which is open discussion. If you want to come to the blackboard and try to solve the, these problems and, and cross-check with my slides with the solutions at the end, okay? Uh, okay, let me, before starting, let me illustrate uh, some references. So there are plenty of, of QCD textbooks in, around us. So here I give just a list of them. I, I confess I did not read all of them. <laughs> we just, uh, I picked up all, uh, in uh, some, uh, uh, topics here and there that are useful to, for my presentation. And I, I must say that I find also lecture notes and handbooks very useful. Here I list uh, two of them that I, I used. Uh, the one, uh, this one is a very nice uh, pocket in, uh, introduction uh, to QCD, a summary of the main features of QCD by the CTEC collaboration people. And uh, this is a, a, a PDF file of all the lectures by Bob Jaffe at the Eriche many years ago in the 96, which are very useful for the, if you want to uh, touch uh, base with the spin problems and, uh, and uh, the operator properties function. And, uh, and also in my slides, I will quote the paper, specific papers whenever it's needed for uh, big results and that I'm quoting in, during my presentation. Okay, so uh, this is the outline. Uh, of, of my uh, uh, lecture. So we'll first try to convince you that within the standard model, QCD is the most exotic uh, theory, a field theory, in, uh, in, this model, in uh, what we know uh, today about uh, the physics of, uh, of the world. And, uh, and then I will uh, uh, try to illustrate the, one of the main, uh, most important tools, of, uh, which is factorization and all the consequences that are related to, to these tools. And then I will start listing the open problems I was mentioning. So for example, uh, how do, uh, can we try to explain the macroscopic properties of the, of the prototype of hadrons, uh, which is the proton, for example, the nucleon, for example, where, where do uh, its mass and spin come from within QCD? And uh, then uh, we'll try to illustrate that we need to have a, a, more, a more complete description of the, mo of the motion of uh, partons inside of the nucleon, including also their orbital motion, so which means uh, going beyond the, the simple approximation where these partons move collinearly with the, with the parent hadron. Then I will uh, illustrate uh, some features of uh, exotic structures that we have we encounter in QCD, which are called carrier odd, uh, that, and people think they are connected to the physics beyond the standard model. And then I will illustrate uh, the, what happens uh, in, the, um, in the more dense and heavier systems in nuclear matter, 
Uh, and in particular, a situation where we have extreme high densities and uh, the, um, uh, sorry, extreme high densities and uh, the, the possible existence of the new uh, universal state of matter. Okay. No, does not work. Ah, okay. Okay, so let's start with the, the first item. So why um, QCD is so exotic? So the, uh, first of all, let me uh, define the, the framework, which is the standard model. So you have seen uh, probably many times uh, this picture. This illustrates uh, the, the, the main features of, of the standard model. So if you read this table by columns, we have two groups. We have uh, on the left, the, uh, the particles, which are fermions. Eh? And on the right, we have bosons, which are, the, the, uh, are supposed to carry the, the force the, with which these particles interact between each other, among each other. And uh, now, if you read this table by line, you will see there are two, uh, on the left, there are two different kinds of particles, quarks and leptons, okay? And, uh, and, um, and then there is this specific particle, uh, the famous gold particle we'll, uh, I will mention uh, in a, in a second. And uh, now uh, this model can describe uh, three of the four, four fundamental interactions. So the first one is the electromagnetic interaction that involves all particles except the neutrinos. And uh, uh, this electromagnetic interaction is uh, uh, mediated by an object, the boson, the photon, which is massless and uh, uh, neutral, has no charge. So it cannot interact with itself, okay? Now, the, uh, the next uh, interaction is the strong interaction we will, uh, where we will focus in the rest of the lecture, which involves only quarks, and it is mediated by, again, a, a, glu a particle, the gluon, which is massless and neutral. But uh, differently from the uh, electromagnetic interaction, it, it has another kind of charge, the color charge, and, uh, and therefore it can inter strongly interact with itself. So this is the main difference with respect to the electromagnetic interaction respect to the behavior of the gluon. Then we have the, the weak interactions that involve all particles, and it's mediated by uh, two massive bosons now, very massive bosons, one neutral, the Z0, and one charge, the W plus, uh, plus or W minus. Uh, I forgot mentioning that you see that one uh, strange thing is that these particles are grouped, uh, if, again, if you read it in, uh, in columns, are grouped uh, in three families, okay? And each family comes as a doublet. So you have the up and the down, the charm and the strange, the top and the bottom. And similarly for the leptons, you have the electron, muon, and town, each one which is paired with uh, its own uh, neutrino partner. Okay? Now, this theory is incomplete, as is well known. First of all, uh, uh, ah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, the, uh, all these particles so far are massless. But where do they take their mass? They take their mass by interacting uh, with the, an external scalar uh, field uh, represented by this particle, the Higgs. So the stronger the interaction, the heavier the particle, okay? And uh, the mechanism through which this happens is the spontaneous breaking of, of a symmetry, which is the, uh, means that basically uh, uh, you have a theory that when you have a theory that has uh, some symmetry, and your ground state, so the state with the minimal energy, does not have the same symmetry. This is the situation which is defined as spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. For example, here on the left, you see a theory with a, a potential surface which is perfectly symmetric, okay? And the minimum, the ground state, the vacuum, is exactly at phi equals zero. So the vacuum is here, and it is the minimum of, the, of this uh, surface, and it has uh, the same uh, symmetry as the theory. But on the, right, on the right, you see an example of a, a potential surface where you still have the symmetry, okay, because the, this surface is perfectly symmetric for uh, rotations, but the minimum, uh, the, the vacuum is no longer stable, and the, uh, the states with the minimal energy are those ones that lies on this circle here at the bottom of this Mexican head. So you have an infinite number of vacua possible. And therefore, the, this symmetry of the theory is broken in the ground state. But this is a, an example of, of, bro, of breaking a, a symmetry. And this is the, the mechanism with which the X boson uh, gives mass to the other particles. Now, the standard model is known to be incomplete. For example, uh, it cannot uh, include the uh, gravitation. Okay? So we don't know, uh, uh, we uh, still don't know what is quantum gravity, uh, uh, is quantum gravity is a well-established theory. 
And uh, so this is a gravit the graviton uh, boson that is supposed to mediate this interaction is still uh, not, uh, not fully uh, demonstrated. Okay. Now, the second uh, open question is why we have three generations of particles? Who knows? Why three? The, the next open question is uh, what is the hierarchy of these particles? For example, uh, I told you that neutrino mass, uh, masses are not related to the Higgs mechanism. So where do, do, uh, do their mass come from? The second uh, open question is that if you plot the masses of the other particles, on, uh, you see here the histogram, the values are scattered. So there is no reason, there are no specific uh, rationale for the ordering of these masses. Uh, uh, for example, this is the top, this is the bottom, this is the tau, the charm, et cetera, et cetera. For example, why, since all particles get their mass from the Higgs, why the mass of the Higgs is smaller than the mass of the top? Who knows? Then there are also other open questions for the asymmetry uh, between matter and antimatter, the, the problem with dark matter, dark energy, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, uh, et cetera. And so you have uh, plenty of, of difficulties here <laughs> and headaches. Now, in, in this lecture, we'll focus on the strong interaction. So we'll, we'll concentrate on the quarks and the, the, the gluon that mediates the strong interaction between these quarks. Now, why is this, uh, uh, the theory that describes the strong interaction is a quantum chromodynamics, so why is it so exotic? Now, let me uh, start from the beginning. The beginning of any field theory is the Lagrangian, okay? And this is the Lagrangian of the QCD, the quantum chromodynamics that describes the strong interaction theory. Apart from uh, gauge fixing terms, uh, the, this is a technicality that I leave to uh, pure theoreticians, no? the bulk of the information is here in this space. So you see, you, yeah, there are two ingredients. First of all, you, you have this uh, field tensor, which is related to this vector field representing the gluon, so the carrier of the strong interaction force. So uh, these are Dirac indices, and the A, B, and C are color indices. And all the other, other indices are understood just to make the notation light. Otherwise, I should, have, should write also the indices for spin, for flavor, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the second ingredient in this Lagrangian is the Psi, the, the, the Dirac field uh, describing the particle. So we have uh, the A mu for the, the career of the interaction, and uh, the Psi is the, uh, describing the particle, which is the quark, okay? Now, how do these uh, particles interact through the gluon field? This is contained in this object, this capital D mu, which is the covariant derivative, okay? that describes, uh, may, uh, technically makes uh, this Lagrangian invariant uh, for uh, under uh, local gauge transformations, and therefore automatically identifies the interaction between Psi and the field, a mu, okay? So, the, uh, and it is this interaction that describes the strong force between different particles. And you see, oops, sorry, okay. And you see that um, uh, there is a new object here entering this covariant derivative, which is this, uh, this uh, uh, T uh, with color index A. These are the generators of the gauge transformation. So we are talking about color, and I'm referring here to the uh, gauge group SU3 that de describes the transformations uh, for, for color charge, that, uh, under which this Lagrangian is locally invariant. And you see that this uh, T uh, do not commute, okay? And uh, the, the commutator produces another T with a different color index. And this, uh, the coefficients, these coefficients are the fine, so-called fine structure constants of the gauge group uh, and are fully antisymmetric. So if you exchange uh, one, uh, one, uh, one pair of uh, color indices, A, A, B, or A, C, or B, C, then you get a minus sign. And this antisymmetry is exactly what makes the, the, also the field tensor antisymmetric. Because if you exchange a mu with nu, and using the antisymmetry of this constant, you get a minus the original uh, uh, um, expression, okay? Now, this, uh, the fact that this commutator is not zero is, uh, um, is translated in, in language that's saying that this gauge theory, gauge field theory, is non-abelian, okay? And this is a specific class. For example, this is the big distinction with the electrodynamics. Electrodynamics is also a field, a gauge field theory, but it is abelian. Okay, now uh, let's look at the, the, the consequences. Uh, this is the uh, Lagrangian. So the fact that the field tensors enter square uh, suggests the following. 
So uh, first of all, the the uh, the field theory, uh, the this uh, vector tensor can interact with itself because we already said that the gluons are color charged; they can interact with this, themselves. But the fact that here we have a squared means that we have also the single vector field interacting with the two of them. So we can have a three linear couplings, so uh, three gluons uh, uh, coupling together. And also we can have the square of this term, so we can have also quadrilinear couplings, four gluons fields interacting together. Okay? This is a, a specific feature of this theory. You don't find uh, these uh, the diagrams in, uh, in uh, electrodynamics. The second uh, um, uh, um, interesting feature is that you can calculate uh, this uh, equation, so these derivatives, uh, so the derivative of the Lagrange with the vector field and the divergence of the derivative of the Lagrange with respect to the gradient, gradient of the field. And these are the Maxwell equations for the field, the gluon field A mu. Okay? Now, this comes the first homework. So you, you, can, if you can play with this uh, and try to derive this equation. Which are the Maxwell equation for a move, and uh, if you, uh, for the Braves that want to, to to try this exercise uh, le, at the end of the day uh, during the discussion session, I, we can uh, you can illustrate your calculation, or if you can't make it, I, I will illustrate with my slides how to get to, to this result. Okay, now. Uh, why I'm mentioning this? It's very interesting because uh, intro, uh, let me introduce a, a sort of a pedagogical example on, the, on the illustrating this specific feature of the QCD. So this Maxwell equation for the vector field uh, uh, is, again, this, uh, you see we have this derivative, this, with this term with the, uh, um, the const, uh, structure constants, and then we have this term on the, on the right-hand side involving the vector, the Dirac fields. The particle. Now, take for example this equation for the e free index nu equals zero. Okay. Now, we, I already said that this uh, field tensor is anti-symmetric. Therefore, if I take this free index nu equals zero, it means that the mu, which is a mute index, can only be a spatial index because if it is zero, uh, f zero zero is zero because it would be uh, equal to minus itself. Okay. And therefore, this is the only comp uh, component that survives, and this means that this derivative becomes the, the, the divergence of the, this component, f e to zero. Now, if I take nu equals zero here, again, the, uh, since I have only f zero i here, uh, and, and uh, the index i is contracted with the mu because of the matrix it produces, uh, because it's a spatial index, because of the matrix, I have a minus sign, okay? And this is the, the terms surviving here. And here on the right hand side, if I take nu equals zero, then I remember that the psi bar means a psi dega gamma zero. And then gamma zero, gamma zero squared is the identity. And therefore, on the right hand side, I have psi dega psi, okay, only. And now I can interpret this thing as the density of the color charge A. And I will indicate this, uh, these um, terms with the, the symbol rho of A. So the density of the color charge A, because psi, dag, uh, psi is a density, probability density. Now, on the, on the left-hand side, F e, uh, I remember that the component F0i is, uh, is defined as the color electric field generated by the, the, the charge A. And because of the anti-symmetry of the, of, the, of the tensor, if I plug in this information here, I can rewrite this equation in this way. Okay. So this uh, tells me that the divergence of the color electric field produced by the charge A uh, uh, plus these terms of interaction with another uh, vector field of color B uh, is generated by the density of the color charge uh, uh, A, okay, with coupling, strong coupling G, okay? And this is nothing by the, the Gauss law for the color charge A. So you have a density of the charge and creates a field outside. But the big difference with the Gaussian law in the electrodynamics is that here on in electrodynamics, you should have the simple derivative, the, the very simple divergence. Here you have the covariant derivative because you have this extra term here, okay? which is due to the fact that the, the, the gluons uh, uh, are charged, interact with, uh, with themselves. Okay, now let's see the co uh, a practical consequence of this expression. Uh, uh, that I are writing here again. So suppose you have a separated color charge A equal one. 
okay? In, uh, so, and I, I, put the, uh, I put it in the origin of my uh, frame of reference here. And therefore, uh, this color charge A produces uh, a field uh, E1, uh, okay? Um, uh, and the, the charge is point-like, so just to keep things simple. So the density is a delta function concentrating on the origin. So uh, this G rho A is tra translated in this way. It's a delta function and a delta on the color charge to A equal one. And the, the, this is a corresponding field which is created outside, okay? The lines are getting out. Uh, uh, this is perfectly similar to electrodynamics. Now, suppose you have a vacuum fluctuation somewhere in space with a color charge two, not one, two, okay? This is represented by this vector field here. Now, what happens? If you have a color, uh, this color fluctuation, A2 here, it means that these terms is active because you have a, a field, color field with C equal one, and you have a fluctuation with B equal two, okay? Therefore, uh, this will create, because of this uh, structure constant, will create a new color field with, uh, with charge three. And because of the anti-symmetry of this uh, structure constant, uh, this uh, the uh, divergence uh, of the, uh, this new color field has a minus sign. So you are basically creating a sink of the color field, uh, uh, electric field with charge three here. So the lines now are entering in the point of the fluctuation, okay? But now that we have a, a color field with charge E again, <laughs> this will produce another contribution to the color field one because of, of this equation. So the divergence of the color field one we, won't be just this term, but I will have to add this new term, okay? It's produced by the new color field and because of the fluctuation. Now, what happens? In the, suppose that I chose the, this uh, uh, fluctuation directed in this way, the pointing uh, to the arrow, uh, blue arrow. Now, in the area where the color field uh, three is parallel to A, then this uh, scalar product is positive. But in the area where this color field is anti-parallel to the, the, uh, the fluctuation, then uh, this scalar product will be negative. So basically, this, uh, the net effect is that I'm creating a dipole, a color dipole, which is po uh, of uh, charge one, which is pointing towards uh, the, ch the original uh, uh, source, the original density of the color charge one. So, for an observer which stays outside, so uh, away from the color charge, I, uh, this observer will see a reinforcement of the color charge one because it stays outside. So it's something that happens uh, uh, contrary to, to the screening that you, you typically learn in, in electrodynamics. So this is called anti-screening. So the longer, the, the, the far away you get from the charge A equal one, because of this fluctuation, you will see that this charge is reinforced. This is the anti-screening. Okay. Then, of course, uh, the, this is not a proof of the, of, the, of the asymptotic freedom or the confinement, of course, because you can choose this blue arrow uh, just uh, uh, in a, another direction because statistically it's possible. Then you will have screening because the dipole will be turned. But this is just to show that you can, because of the fact that the gluon can interact with itself, you, you can have anti, also anti-screening. This phenomenon is absent in electrodynamics. Okay. Now, if you look at experimental data and the uh, rigorous calculations, you see that the, uh, the, co the coupling constant, the strong coupling constants, uh, decreases uh, for increasing uh, momenta, which means uh, for a smaller distances. Okay? So, uh, and while it increases for a smaller momenta, which means larger distances. So basically, this plot, the, the data themselves, uh, tells us that at a small momenta, which means larger distances, the anti-screening is overwhelming the screening. And therefore, the, your coupling is uh, stronger the, the, the more far away you get from, from your particle. So this is exactly the opposite trend of the electromagnetic interaction. It's like a spring. So, so it's like a, uh, the two co color charges are, relate, uh, are bound by a spring. You, if you try to keep them apart, one from the other, then the, 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 uh, you have to spend more, more, uh, more force, okay? Now, uh, where does this trend of the uh, coupling constant come from? Now, uh, take the QED, uh, electrodynamics and QCD. They are both renormalizable field theories. So they're, they're renormalizable because the couplings are, are dimensionless, okay? 
Now, uh, if uh, renormalizable means also that uh, you, intro, you, know, you have divergences and you cure them by introducing a specific scale where you, can, you, are allowed, you introduce uh, counter terms to get rid of the divergences. And then uh, you, you get rid of divergences, of course, but then you have this de fake dependence of the scale, the renormalization scale, which is not physical because physics doesn't care about, about uh, renormalization. Then you have to get rid of this dependence, and you have to impose that your observables, your, for example, your green functions, is independent, does not depend on the scale. And this is the, the source of the so called Callan Simansic equations. One of the byproducts of this equation is the running coupling constant. So if G is the coupling of the theory, the, uh, the, then the, uh, the outcome of this equation is that the coupling uh, changes with the scale changes with this parameter t, which is related to the log of the scale of the theory with, with respect to the renormalization scale. And the, the, the function that, that drives this change uh, is the so-called beta function. Now what happens? In QAD, when the coupling is the, the, the electromagnetic coupling, uh, okay, then the beta function is positive. Okay? So this means that this object, uh, 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 is very small for, for uh, small Q square, uh, relatively small Q square. It is a famous uh, stru fine structure constant, 1 over 137. Eh? But then when you increase Q squared, sometimes uh, uh, close to the Planck scale, it uh, starts to blow up. So it increases with the scale. Now, what happens in QCD? In QCD, when the coupling is uh, the so-called, uh, the famous alpha strong, uh, the beta function is this one. Here I illustrated the the perturbative expansion up to the, the second order, the next leading order. And you see this parameter, B0, which is the leading order one, depends on the number of flavors, number of flavors. And uh, so far we know only six flavors, okay, uh, or quarks, and two times an F divided by three is four. And 11 minus four is a positive number, is seven. Therefore, if B0 is positive, this minus sign in front of everything makes uh, this uh, beta function in QCD negative. And that's why the running club coupling or the, uh, the running of the strong coupling constant is exactly the, the mirrored one with respect to the, the QCD. So the, long, the higher the scale, the smaller the intensity of the interaction. Okay? And this is what is called asymptotic freedom eh? and it uh, um, uh, was worth the Nobel Prize to Gross, Policher, and Wilson. And this is a specific uh, feature of the QCD as a non-abelian gauge field theory, renormalizable and in four dimensions. This is the only, is, uh, the only example of field theory that has this feature, okay? And uh, the question is what happens here at low scales? It's, uh, you know, uh, there is a, this conventional threshold which is the, named uh, lambda QCD, which at, uh, basically is the threshold below which people do not trust perturbative expansions any longer. So the question is, uh, what happens below that? That justifies uh, the confinement, the fact that we don't see three quarks around, that they are all confined within hadrons, okay? This is the one, uh, the big problem, or millennial problem, actually. There is a millennial price for, for, uh, for solving this problem. Now, uh, let me come uh, to factorization now, the second topic of my, uh, my program. So factorization means that you, you, when you uh, address a problem, you try to simplify it, just divide it in pieces. The, the, this is basically the bulk of the, of the message. And it is a, a very well-known problem, not only QCD, everywhere. For example, if you, uh, in nuclear physics, if you study an interaction within a probe and a target, for example, a scattering of an electron on, on the target, since we are dealing with the nucleon, let's consider the, the, uh, a an adron with uh, spin one up, okay? And even in the general case, if you have an, el an elastic scattering, then you have an electron here with energy E that uh, loses some en uh, energy, transfers some energy nu to the system and some uh, sp um, uh, spatial momentum so that the, the mass of this virtual photon is Q squared. And then the, the electron is scattered with some angle, theta E, okay? Now, the, cr the, the cross-section uh, for this, describing this scattering uh, differential in the solid angle of the detected hadron, ele electron sorry, is the famous Rosenblut formula. And this is factorized because it's written in terms of a MOT cross-section, which depends only on the energies of the, of, the, of the electron and of this scattering angle. 
And on the right hand side, there is a combination of objects called the structure functions that describe the st internal structure of your target. You have two structure functions because uh, this object is spin one half. If it has a spin zero, you have only one structure function. Okay? Now, uh, why is this factor? Uh, the, what is the idea of factorization? The idea is that the mod cross section is uh, supposed to describe the scattering in the simplest case, which is uh, supposing that your target is point like. Is a char point like charge. And uh, this uh, cross section describes the, the Coulomb elastic scattering. And uh, the rest of the information of the structure of your target is separated, factorized within this structure function. Okay? So, this is a, an example of, of a factorization uh, where you separate the interaction within the probe, uh, with the probe from the structure of your target. This holds also in the elastic case. So, in the elastic case where the energy transfer is related, to the Q square uh, in a, this way, and therefore is not an independent variable. And then your structure function depends only on Q square, no, no longer on mu. Still, the Rosenbull formula works. Okay, so factorization is is uh, always there. Now uh, there is an also another uh, interesting field where factorization uh, holds, uh, which is the part of model. Part of model, what what is it? Uh, in, in this context, it's just the extension of the previous formula to the case of the deep inelastic regime, where the, uh, what is deep inelastic regime is when Q squared goes to infinity, in practice is much larger than any mass scale of, in your problem, and you keep this ratio, Q squared over 2 uh, pi uh, p dot Q uh, fixed, and p is the momentum of your target, initial target, okay? Uh, and the Q is the, the, the momentum transfer. Okay, this space like so is the opposite of a capital Q squared. This is the famous Birkin variable. Now, uh, what's the, the part of model is, uh, is an idea of Feynman. What, uh, what was his picture of the problem? Uh, if you look at the collision between electron and the, uh, this target in the center of mass frame, so his idea was the following, to represent the target as an ensemble of virtual particles called partons. Uh, partons, but why? Because the, each one of them carries a fraction x between 0 and 1 of the total momentum of the target. Okay? And uh, the second assumption is that uh, the, all these partons are moving collinear with the target. So just uh, share a fraction of the, the momentum of the target, and, in spatial, and the spatial components are always, always the same. And now, what happens to the electron that, that uh, hits this uh, configuration in the center of mass? Now, if we push Q squared to the infinity, uh, so we, we enter the, ah, sorry, uh, one more detail. Uh, when does the electron interact with these virtual partons? Whenever the uh, impact parameter, so the distance between its trajectory and the position of the parton, is smaller than, uh, than the, one, uh, the inverse of the hard scale, okay? Because of the uh, uh, determination principle. Now, if we push Q squared to infinity, the, uh, the deep inelastic regime, what happens? In this center of mass frame, you have two uh, effects from the Lorentz transformation. The first one is spatial in the sense that the electron sees a, a, an hadron which is squeezed along the direction of motion, becomes a disk because of Lorentz contraction. And also, the, this virtual particle, their lifetime becomes longer and longer because they're dilated because of the Lorentz factor. Therefore, uh, uh, the electron takes a, 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 a very short time to cross this disk and the sees the partons which are living uh, uh, longer, longer and longer. Therefore, you can approximate the fact that electrons sees an ensemble of free, almost free particles on shell. Okay? This is the way to realize in the parton model the asymptotic freedom. So inside, inside the hadron, you have particles that behave like they, they are free particles, which means that their mutual interaction is very small, asymptotic freedom. Okay? Now, uh, the, because of the, uh, the fact that the electron crosses the, this disk in a very short time, the time, the time scale of this hard interaction between the electron and the parton is much smaller than the time, time that, is, that this, uh, uh, the residual of the, this target takes to form the hadronic final state. So we have a separation in time between the hard interaction and the recombination of the remnants to form the final state. Not only, well, one last comment, that because of this, uh, uh, you may wonder if the, if the electron interacts with more than one particle, okay? 
instead of just one. So you, you, uh, you want to calculate the probability of finding another parton close to the struck one. Okay? And what is this probability? Uh, approximately is the ratio between the area of this hard interaction, which is the basically a square, uh, a square with a side one over Q, divided by the, uh, the impact area of the target, which is uh, pi times uh, the square of this radius, which is not changed by the Lorentz transformation. Therefore, you have one over Q squared divided by pi R squared, which goes to zero in the deep inelastic regime. Therefore, you, uh, the probability to have uh, more than uh, the, the electron to interact with more than one particle is vanishing. Then, uh, basically, you have uh, the, your uh, global interaction is a sum of incoherent scattering of the electron of each particle. So uh, this led um, Feynman to formulate the cross-section in the factorized form. So it's an incoherent sum of hard scattering uh, between the electron and the parton. This hard scattering is described by a cross-section, uh, which is a nothing but a electrodynamic cross-section of an electron scattering on the free particle, spin one up particle. You can calculate in electrodynamics at the, the perturbative of order that, that you want. Depends on your ability to calculate correction. And the, the, why factorization? Because uh, uh, then I have to uh, uh, put together to this information the information of the structure of my target. Uh, therefore, there must be some unknown function that describes uh, uh, the life of the partons before the hard interaction. So this is a probability density of finding a parton uh, with, uh, with some quantum numbers and uh, carrying exactly that fraction of momentum x. Okay? Of course, uh, since partons carry a fraction of momentum x, uh, the sum of all this, this momenta must satisfy the, but uh, you must recover the momentum of the parent addon, so you have to satisfy a sum rule. And again, uh, this is an example of factorization between the, the hard interaction probe uh, parton and the structure of your target. Okay? Now, uh, in the part of model, uh, you would expect this cross-section to be written in terms of two structure functions, like the Rosenbaud formula. Eh? Uh, the, the, let's say where the structure functions are the partners of those Ws in the deep inelastic regime. Conventionally, they are written F, F2 and F1. Now, the problem, uh, the problem, the, the uh, one feature of the part of model is that instead you find that these two structure functions, F1 and F2, are no, not in all independent. One depends on the other. And this dependency is called the callan gross relation. What is the physical meaning of this relation? It's the fact that in the part of model, the quarks, uh, uh, spin one half objects like quarks, free uh, objects, can absorb only uh, a specific polarization of your virtual photon exchanged, only the transverse polarization. And we can understand this uh, intuitively in this way. If you sit in the, in the uh, center of mass frame with specific features, uh, namely that you don't have energy, energy transfer. So you have your virtual photon and your parton. You are in the center of mass frame, but there is no transfer of energy. This is called bright frame, okay? Now, uh, the parton just comes here and bounces back what, and, uh, with, with no transfer of energy. What, do, uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, you, you flip two things on the, this parton, the, mom, the spatial momentum, uh, uh, initially as minus something, it becomes plus something. And also the helicity, which is the projection of the spin along the direction of motion. From, from, for example, from minus one half to plus one half. So the, the important thing is that you have a, a change of one unit of helicity in this bouncing, okay? Now, since this parton is free, almost free, we can assume that this interaction, uh, uh, this system, the, the virtual photon and the parton is an isolated system because the parton is almost free. It does not interact with other partons, okay? And therefore, in this isolated system, the helicity is conserved along the direction of the collision. Okay? So this jump of one unit of helicity must be balanced from the, on the other side, from the virtual photon. But the only way to balance this is if the, the uh, virtual photon is transversely polarized. Because the rule of the, of, the, of the right hand, if it is transversely polarized, it carries one unit of orbital angular momentum along the Z direction. If the uh, virtual photon is longitudinally polarized, this uh, balance does not happen. This means that if you rewrite your cross-section in terms of structure functions sensitive to the, uh, the polarization of the virtual photon, the FL, so the structure function uh, sensitive to the longitudinal polarization, must go to zero. And it uh, magically happens that this FL is equal to this combination of F1, F2, which is zero. 
and, there, and this uh, gives you the color and cross relation, okay? So this is the way you can rewrite your cross-section in the part of the model in terms only of one structure function, conventionally the F2. The F2 is related, directly related to the density of your partons, okay? Uh, uh, y, uh, this Y is uh, electron inelasticity, so the ratio between the energy transferred and the energy of the initial electron, and this AY is this function of Y. Now, you can see that, first of all, uh, if you extract from data uh, the, the F2, then you have direct access in the part of model to the structure, so to the density of partons for that flavor, okay? Summing of all flavors. And the second important thing is that you see there is no Q-square dependence here. So the, uh, in jargon, is, uh, you say that the F2 structure function scales, okay? Now, uh, we have several problems with this, with this model. The first one is that the, the sum rule on the momentum of the parton is violated. And again, uh, this is uh, very intuitive. Uh, um, uh, we, we go back to the first measurements of the elastic scattering as luck, uh, so the late uh, 60s. Uh, where they measure the, the F2 structure function for deep in elastic scattering on protons and on effective ne neutron targets. And this integral in the X, uh, from an experimental point of view, you should think as a discrete sum of all uh, data points, okay? And this is the number they found for this integral, okay? Now, in the, in the part of model, remember F2 is, is uh, connected to the, the, uh, the densities. So in the proton, you have up, down, and, uh, and uh, da up and down quarks. So this uh, uh, F2 for the proton becomes this, approximately. If we forget about the other flavors, okay? So you have a four ninths of the ch square charge of the up and the anti-up, and one ninth for the square of the charge of the down and the anti-down. Now, neutron. Neutron, uh, you, you, you have a mirror uh, situation because uh, the, basically the role of the up is, uh, is taken by the down and vice versa. And you know the strong interaction is uh, symmetric with respect to isospin transformation. And therefore, you can think that the role of the up in the neutron can be taken by the down in the proton and, the, and the, the vice versa for the down in the neutron and the up in the proton. Therefore, you can rewrite this expression for the neutron just exchanging up and down, but now with the advantage that any distribution here, any parton density here is taken in the proton. So we are homogeneous and not in the neutron. Now, with this, this expression, you build up this, uh, uh, this uh, combination and you end up with this. So you have a 5 18th, which is 0.28 times the sum rule. Okay? That is supposed to be one, the sum rule. So the sum of all momenta of the pantons should be the momentum of the, of the parent hadron. Now you see that in order to uh, co uh, reconcile this result with this, you have to assume that the sum rule is equal to 0.5, not to one. So the, the, the message is that the quarks carry only half of the momentum of the parent uh, nucleus. Okay? And where is the rest? Uh, we know now, now we know it's a gluon, but at that time it, it was a surprise. Okay, this result was confirmed also from, by the Gargamel uh, collaboration at CERN a few years later. Okay, okay now this is a, a big problem of the part of model. The second big problem is that experimental observation tells you that the uh, structure function of F2 in rea reality scales, depends on Q squared. And the Kalan gross relation, so the longitudinal structure function is not zero. Why? Because if you include gluons in your theory, then it is possible that the, the parton absorbs uh, also the longitudinal uh, polarization of the virtual photon without violating the, the conservation of the ELISA. Okay? And, uh, and uh, you see this is a collection of data from uh, HERA, the uh, first colli electron proton collider, and the fixed target results. You see this is the F2 as a function of Q squared at different values of X. The smallest values of X are here on the top, and the highest is here. And the, for readability, the, these results are scaled by 2 to the I, where I is an index, here is just 1, and here is uh, 26. And just uh, don't make things uh, uh, readable, otherwise there would be overlap. So you see that uh, there is a scaling, so the F2 uh, depends on Q squared. Now, uh, this, all these things put together uh, basically uh, bring from the part of model to QCD. So the part of model is a sort of zeroth order of QCD. And uh, this means that the cross section is no longer a function of F2, uh, contains also a contribution coming from FL, eh, because the current gross relation is, not, is violated. 
and, but uh, still, uh, you, are, you can prove now, it's not an assumption, but you can prove that the, this structure function can be written in a factorized form. And this is the so-called QCD collinear factorization theorem. So you see that you can write, now the, the things are a little more complicated, but the structure function here still can be expressed as a convolution, which is defined here uh, on this psi variable, a convolution between the, 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 the unknown objects describing the structure of your target and the calculable coefficients called the Wilson coefficients that describe your hard interaction. Now the complication comes in that the fact that this psi variable is contained uh, app, uh, appears in both um, ingredients, so the, this is the origin of the convolution, and the fact also that the, the two ingredients depend on the same factorization scale, which is a technical fictitious scale that needs to be introduced to, prove, to, to come to this proof. Okay, this uh, factorization is proved at all orders in the sense that these Wilson coefficients can be calculated perturbatively, and, uh, depends on your ability, up to any order, okay? And still, this factorization form holds, okay? And uh, conventionally, this factorization scale is keep an equal to Q squared, like uh, typically people do also for the renormalization scale. But still, it's there. Eh? Now, what's the meaning? Uh, the meaning of this factorization scale uh, is this fictitious, as I said, so it's something that physics doesn't care about. So if uh, your Wilson coefficient depends on the factorization scale and the structure depends on the factorization scale, the two dependencies should combine in order to make your physics, so the observable structure function, independent from this object. And that, uh, the, the outcome of this requirement are the uh, DGLAP evolution equations. What, what is the content of this evolution equation? DGLAP stands for Dokshitzer, Glibor, Lipato, Valtarelli, Parisi. Okay? And the, the, um, the content is the following. Basically, the, this equation describes how the, your structure, so your unknown uh, part on density, changes with mu f for the factorization scale, such that it compensates the change in mu f of the Wilson coefficient in order to build this structure function independent of mu f. Okay, this is uh, the expression of these uh, evolutions. So this for the quark and this for the gluon. Uh, you see there are convolutions exactly defined in the same ways as here, and they involve the densities, uh, the quark and the gluon, and uh, some functions which are called the splitting functions, which are basically the probability for a quark to split in a quark or to split in a gluon, and a gluon to split in a quark on, on a gluon. There is perfect symmetry. So you see from this expression that first of all, each equation is an integral differential equation. Integral because the integral is contained here, and differential because uh, uh, it gives you, uh, okay, contains the derivative of, the, of, the, of your uh, unknown uh, distribution. And also you see that quark and glues uh, appear in both equations. So they are coupled. They are a coupled system of integral differential equations. Very difficult, okay? Now, the, uh, as I said, so uh, they describe how this uh, structure changes with uh, fictitious scale, factorization scale. So basically the rule is that whatever has a, a, a virtuality larger than mu f square, this is something that you can uh, compute per perturbatively and uh, you can uh, uh, calculate in this Wilson coefficient. So this diagram is, can be calculated perturbatively. But the partons belonging to diagrams with a scale, are the, with a virtuality, which is smaller than factorization scale, this you can't calculate perturbatively, and therefore these are part of the, of the information hidden in this unknown parton density. And the moving these factorization scales produces the change of the content of these uh, um, parton densities, okay, that are described here according to the DGLAP equation. This means that your, your, you can think of your virtuality as your mi microscope, okay? The smaller, the, sorry, the higher the virtuality, higher Q squared, the smaller distances you can, you can probe inside your target, okay? So you can see deeper and deeper. So for example, if you start from a very low Q squared, you can see the proton as a point-like object. But if you increase Q squared, you can start seeing the, its valence structure. It's uh, the fact that it's made by two uh, up and one down. And then if you increase Q squared, you see more complicated structure, more partons, okay? More, uh, more complicated diagrams. Remember the sum rule. So the sum of the momentum of these partons must always be the same as the, your, uh, the momentum of your parent hadron. 
So if you see more partons, it means that each one of these partons carries a smaller fraction of x, the momentum. So the higher the q square, the smaller the x, the higher the number of partons and the smaller x they carry, okay? And you can see this in data, because if I show you again the picture before, you see that this is F2. Uh, for a very small x, you see that it grows with Q square. So uh, a small x, I'm looking for partons with very small x, and the higher the Q square, the more I find, or, uh, the more partons I find. And in fact, F2 increases. But if I go to high x, so I am looking for partons carrying a very large fraction of the parent momentum, the more uh, I increase Q squared, the less partons I, found, I find. And in fact, the F2 drops, okay? So this is perfectly consistent. Okay, now, uh, last, uh, yeah, four minutes, la last uh, topic of this uh, lecture, the universality. So, I mean, this factorization scale divides things that can be calculated perturbatively from things that uh, cannot be calculated and are hidden in the structure. Therefore, uh, this part on the left, so the structure, is something which is independent of the process, of the hard process that they can calculate. Because it's something that pertaining only of the target, specific of the target, okay? And therefore, it's universal, independent of the process. This is uh, uh, the way we intend the universal. So these objects, the, the phi f, the part on density or part on distribution functions, are universal in the sense that they, they, are, they are specific to the target. They describe the, the life of partons inside the, that target. On the other side, instead, uh, thing, these things uh, with virtuality higher than mu f squared are, can be calculated, okay? Uh, in, uh, so, uh, perturbatively. So, therefore, they depend strictly on the process. Uh, the, the partons that enter in this diagram are, not, I mean, are the same independently of the target that they are coming from because I'm considering only the hard interaction. And therefore, uh, this object does not, uh, depends on the process, the Wilson coefficients, but, but it does not depend on the kind of, of species of uh, target that I'm using, okay? Now, in, uh, if you add to this the fact that the Diglap evolution equation tell us how this structure changes with Q square, this is a very powerful predictive power. Because suppose, for example, you, you perform two experiments, two different processes, using the same target. So a deep analysis scattering of the proton, but happening at different scales. Right? Uh, one scale, a low scale, and one higher, higher scale. Two different experiments. Then the cross session is written in a factorized form in both cases. You have calculable Wilson coefficients that the, the, uh, the calculable at different scales, and they, they are both calculable, and they are different because the two processes are different. For example, I'm doing deep analysis scattering, I'm doing a Drellian, for example, on, a, on another scale. But the part of distribution functions that are computed at two different scales, they are always related to the proton. So the, the part of distribution function here is the same here. The, the, is connected, the two things are connected only by uh, evolution equation. And also, this, may, uh, uh, is behind, uh, this is what is behind the strategy of groups that are fitting experimental data to extract information with this, uh, about this unknown structure, the part of densities. They are basically writing this cross section for all processes that they, they, are, they are including in their fit. Eh? They are calculating the Wilson coefficients at the different scales and the different processes. And then they are parameterizing the, the part on density, part on distribution function, in the same way if, the, pro, if, the, if the, the target is the same, of course, in all processes, they are parameterizing only once. Okay? And they are connecting the expression of the different cross sections through evolution. Okay, in order to uh, match all the different scales of the, pro, of, the, of the different experiments they are considering in their fit. And then fitting those data, they fix the parameters uh, uh, of this uh, parameterization of the PDF, <coughs> and they can extract information of the, on the part on distribution function. And this is the outcome. So we, uh, nowadays we have a lot of groups, a lot of parameterization in the market. Uh, and uh, of course, the number increases uh, uh, and the, the capability increases as soon as new data are available. So you see here, this was the Tevatron era, now the first run of LSE. This is the second run of, of LSE. Now we are waiting for data from the third run and so on. And you see that from the color code, uh, those one in green, for example, include a uh, uh, run at LSE at seven and eight GV. 
the, the, one, uh, the latest one here include also data the 13 GV. Eh? And those one, the both boxes with the red labels are those ones that now can calculate the Wilson coefficients up to the next to next leading order, which in deep inelastic scattering means uh, that you are calculating this uh, expansion up to alpha less square. Okay? But there are already attempts uh, to, to approximate the next to next to next leading order results. You can look at this paper. Okay? And this is what, how the, this, this part on distribution function look like uh, nowadays. This is, for example, this parameterization at next to next leading order at 10 GV squared. So this, you see, this is the up distribution and this is the down distribution. You see they are picked at X approximately one third, like all valence quarks, because in, in the valence picture, each uh, pattern should carry one third of the, of the momentum of the parent pattern. Okay, I'm coming. And then uh, you see all the rest, the, the C quarks, so this is the charm. Here, here you find the strange and the anti up, anti down. And you see the glue on this red line, which is divided by 10. So it's huge. The gluon is huge. Okay? And then we'll come back to this later. It's one of the open problems. Okay, so I'm almost perfect. <laughs> I'm stopping here and uh, see you in the, in the second lecture. Thank you.